that that's actually part of like the without going into it right now but the the base and thesis is like have you read it's, it's a depressing book but uh uninhabitable earth or you, you probably you've probably read his article. sounds, it, sounds it, awesome <laughs> uh D david wallace wells okay is, uh, just read like the vanity fair or whatever i can't remember what it was rolling stone or all you need to do is yeah basically just read the title but that's his thesis is, is that everything's going to have to either move north or south and basically the between the Tropic of Cancer and Tropic of Capricorn will be uninhabitable within like hundred years. So, oh, dude. <laughs> unless we, you know, unless we act. So, hey, let me ask you one more question before we get rolling here. Like when I was reading all this, I was thinking, like, is is the audience for this? Are you assuming that they have like a basic understanding of crypto, blockchain, that kind of stuff, or? Should I ask you questions uh, specifically about just the, the overall concept? Of it's yeah. So that's the thing, Mikey, is I'm, I'm not trying to steer it at all. Like, okay, I, okay. I want to, to meet you guys uh, where you are. And okay. then we have we, I have a couple of thesis about like when we use the word DAO, when we don't like who, you know, who we're talking to. You know, are they crypto, crypto native or are they net zero corporation native? Or, you know, are they tr you know, TradFi as a. Um, traditional finance is like a acronym we we use. Um, so we you know we kind of have we're developing like a thesis around that. Okay, cool. So, but I'll, but I'll kind of uh, I'll set that up here in the intro. So no pressure. No, no, I don't. I don't feel any pressure. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hey everybody, Timo here. Uh, today I have the pleasure of being joined by my esteemed brother-in-laws. They've kind of been curious as to what we're up to with Basin in Basin Dow, and I kind of wanted to give them what would I call, we're, we're gonna do like a brother-in-law sniff test, right? Or, or brother-in-law breakdown where they, they you know, these two guys, John and Mike know me probably probably better than anybody besides my wife. And so I, I would appreciate you guys like calling me out on stuff, right? You, you know my personality, you know my history, you, you, know, you know my talking about what I, you know, what we're working on, so I, I just want to kind of run it through the the ringer. And you guys remember that guy, um, Russ, right? In Hawaii once? Oh, yeah. And, and after Russ Fondly. Russ, <laughs> Fondly. <laughs> after Russ left, you guys, what was the term you guys used about? I think it was a, a BS meter or BS radar or something. <laughs> yeah, the, yeah, the BS flowed freely from our boy Russ. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we're so, using the rust, the scale of rust on this one. You can, you can start. You can start at at the rust br um, or bs radar. Or, Z zero to rust. Zero to rust. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, I get it now. Thank you. Yeah. So so what we're gonna, you know you guys are basically going to ask me questions or and I'm you know we'll just what, what I'm trying to do is avoid jargon. Right. We're like we're trying to meet people where they are in terms of and I'm going to use jargon right now in terms of Web three. Regenerative finance, natural capital, uh, you know, crypto, blockchain, like these, all, there's all these trendy words. So when I use jargon, I'd like you to call me out on it and, or at least let's try and define it kind of as we go down the path. But um, I, I just want to quickly introduce you guys real quick. And I'm, I'm going to start with Johnny here because he's our, our senior, Mikey. Uh, but Mr. John has been in uh, for 25 years. He's also a real estate entrepreneur and a design expert. And he's one of the, the most uh, responsible guys I know when it comes to money management. So uh, super psyched to have John here. Uh, Mike, is there anything I missed about Uncle Johnny? Oh, he's got the best hair of the three of us. <laughs> so it's important, important well, to get out the there. Bar's pretty, the bar is pretty low. Yeah, that's not saying much, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try to come up with something that's more complimentary. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> and and then Mike, uh, or Mike E, my other brother-in-law, uh, is, is founder and co-owner of Bad Fish SUP, which I consider a lifestyle brand and uh, whitewater product designer, outfitter, uh, retailer, manufacturer. Uh, he's also the founder of Arc River Trust, which he started, I think, about 22 years ago. And that's you know, one of our first conversations, Mike, was around the Arc River Trust before I even knew Shelby, my wife. And um, Mike is also a designer, creator, builder 
of uh, whitewater parks around the country. And a lot of those whitewater parks uh, revolve around river restoration, habitat restoration, um, and play a crucial part in kind of restoring uh, native, you know, I, I guess you call them like in-stream water flows. And so, um, Johnny, any, anything I missed about Mikey there? Um, I would just say he's very well read, probably one of the more intelligent people I know just in terms of um, what's going on out there in terms of news and all that kind of good stuff. And then he's a real people person. So very good at communication and uh, public speaking and all that good stuff. So, yeah, nothing but love for, for Uncle Mikey. Thanks, JC. I feel guilty now that all I came up with was about your hair. <laughs> You're more than your hair. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Yeah, I, Thanks, I, Tina. I, yeah, Johnny, I think Mike has a future role. And, you know, the joke has always been Mayor Mikey. I don't know if politics are his shtick, but I think writing might write after seeing some of the things he wrote this summer and uh, this January a few weeks ago. Uh, I think we're going to see Mikey being a published author somewhere. Oh, yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Well, yeah, proud, proud to be the, the, the uh, one of the founding members of the Drunk Uncles. Mm -hmm. Maybe that will be the, the image art, the Drunk Unc. Uh, t-shirt yep. from 2005 that, yeah. that will be the, for this yeah. episode cool well um yeah so no holds barred guys um yeah jargon i'm gonna meet you know meet you at like where you are and we're gonna go down the rabbit hole of basin dow and web3 and carbon crypto so just let, let me know where you want to start well um i, I mean go you want to go johnny um you can go mike I, but i do have a question right off the bat then fire away. <clears throat> okay. Um, and I think I might have um, discussed this with Mike just a little bit, but since we're kind of um, asking questions, it, it felt difficult to try to make a donation or an investment, <laughs> you know, for, and I'm a little bit in the crypto, but not crazy, but having to sign up for another place and send my ETH there, for, it just, I was like, man, for it being high tech kind of stuff, I was like, why is it so difficult? You know what I mean? I guess that was my first kind of interaction. I was like, I wanted to make a donation or an investment, but it was, uh, it's, it seemed like you had to jump through hoops and it, and it wasn't very seamless. So that was like my first impression, uh, with trying to, trying to do this. So I don't know. Yeah. So, so what Johnny's referring to there is the, the Gitcoin round or the, the Gitcoin uh, grant rounds, which happened in December. And, and I agree, Johnny, like, I mean, that's the first time I've participated in that uh, fundraising round, but the Gitcoin website was a little slow, it was a little clunky, and then you had to um, connect your wallet, right? And then gas fees on the time of day. And that, that's one of the big criticisms of, of Ethereum is like when you actually do a Ethereum transaction, the gas fees, like it, you know, it's normally mm -hmm. a few percent, like this, you know, you send the gas fees go down with the bigger amounts of money you send. But like, you know, one time I think I was trying to send 250 bucks somewhere and the gas fee was like $3,000, right? It was like ridiculous. Oh my so, gosh. So, wow. that, so that, so that, you know, like Ethereum is considered a uh, layer one blockchain and there's these new blockchains popping up, which are considered layer two, like Polygon, like Matt, you know, you actually turned me on to Matic, Johnny. And mm -hmm. like, yeah. The, the the theory there is that the the gas fees are going to go down. You you'll sacrifice uh, security and like um, transparency in terms of like being off the Ethereum main chain uh, by using mm -hmm. Polygon, but you'll you'll pay less gas fees. Uh, but but I agree that onboarding process with that grants round was challenging and um, difficult. And then also you couldn't actually donate with fiat with like U.S. dollars. You could only donate with Ethereum or Ethereum tokens ERC. Uh, type tokens, or you could also uh, convert to Dai, which is a, a U.S. dollar stable coin. But even then, mm -hmm. was like you, you know, you have to use. You know, they had three different wallets. They had like the Polygon wallet, the Ethereum wallet Connect, and then they had the Dai or you know zk Sync or zk Snark wallet. Which like some of that stuff gets super complicated. It gets complicated really fast. So that's to me that's a big barrier to entry in terms of onboarding anyone to Web three or crypto. 
so so 100 yeah. percent and and i and, and i i'll uh, send this little snippet to uh gitcoin um and, and i sound like such a boomer but i was like can i just write you a check <laughs> You know, and, and and you can't like that. So 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 where Basin Dow is 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 we're at the intersection of like we call it IRL or in you know in real life or or the metaverse or you know we're at the intersection of both. And to do climate work, carbon work, nature work, we have to interact in the real world with real counties, cities, governments, corporations, businesses, legal systems, financial systems. But then also we have at our disposal all these new tools and technologies to make it move faster uh, at the speed and scale uh, we need it to move in order in order to move the the climate needle of this impending uh, climate crisis. So um, mm -hmm. it's, it's so like it, so Basin is is basically working at that level of like yes you can write us a check and we will have a a, a real world legal entity that has real world bank accounts. But then we're also operating uh, with wallets and crypto and, and on the blockchain or different blockchains. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and to us, like you have to do both. Like there's there's this whole school of thought with like crypto, like and that's you know that's the underlying thesis of crypto is like cryptography and like uh, anonymity. And, and then there's a whole sect of like pseudonymity, however you say that, like pseudonym people, like you don't necessarily know who they are or you know mm -hmm. like. Their, their real names or what their real jobs are. But we feel like yeah. to do climate work, like you have to know who's behind the little avatar, right? You see on Twitter, like you can use your little PFP on Twitter, but at the end of the day, you need to like know who, you know, who are you giving your money to, right? If it's a true blockchain project, like maybe you don't need to because it's like a protocol and you're not, it's, it's trustless, it's permissionless. But the way we're organizing is like, it's this bridge between real world and metaverse tools. And to us, at least our thesis is like it takes real scientists, real biologists, ecologists, uh, finance people, philanthropists to like do this work. Like you, you can't just hide behind a, a crypto address, like a, a wallet address. Yeah. Watch me warm so up team, Johnny on the on the boomer meter okay. here in a minute. Thousand. <laughs> 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 uh, Mikey, do you have another boomer related question? Yeah, I do. I, I would go back two more <laughs> steps even from where you were. But um, I mean, because I, you know, I mean, I I have a little bit of Bitcoin. I bought on Cash App and that's like, that's it, man. I don't really understand. I read a book actually, because you motivated me to. I read a book about the blockchain. So I know enough to where if I'm having a beer with somebody that knows nothing about Web3, I could kind of sound like a smart guy. But then if somebody like the next bar stool over actually knew about Web3, I would be embarrassed real quickly. Um, so my question is this is my first question is what why blockchain at all for, for these efforts that you're like, what what advantages does crypto Web3 impart um, on this goal that you have? Like, I can understand the, the, the basic concept of uh, let's bu let's buy properties that have a. Um, restorative or environmental benefit and then let's find a market for those benefits but what adding the layer of the um basin dot protocol and the and the crypto i, I get confused about why so the I mean, I mean i would say the biggest thing is is trust in transparency in lack of of needing to rely on a central authority um like in the carbon markets for example there's, you know, there, many of them are nonprofits, but there's these verify, like these methodologies of where the carbon credits are come from, basically, of how, how they're verified and reported. And the common term people use is black box. Like you don't necessarily know how the soup gets made. Like you can like go and you can download a hundred page PDF and see all the project data and reports, but you have to basically go through that. And then you're trusting a third party, basically whoever wrote that report uh, to rely on that. Um, but it's it's very centralized. Like you have a um, a verify like a, a methodology like a verification system, and then you have um, like the field analyst who writes the report, and that's another. So you you have two kind of centralized actors, and in theory they're supposed to be separate of the project developer, whoever has actually hired them to do the work. But the the you know what I've heard it referred to as the black box, where you don't necessarily know that full relationship because these people have been doing it for twenty years and working together with very little competition. So the idea of like 
regen network, for example, bringing carbon credits and eco credits on chain or open forest protocol is another one that's going to launch on the near blockchain. Um, and even even Toucan protocol with their base carbon ton, basically putting all that data on chain without a centralized actor. Like no one necessarily owns the, the regen blockchain. I mean, there's token holders and the, the open forest blockchain is the same way. Like there's going to be token holders, but basically there it it provides like a decentralized source of truth that anybody can mm -hmm. uh, challenge, review, and verify. And it's and the, the theory is it's kind of like you have the project developer who's like doing the project, they upload their data. Then you have a third party verifier or multiple third party verifiers who come in, verify the data. And then you even have like a, a remote sensing aspect of like satellite imagery, internet of things, geospatial data. That's like another way or layer of verification. And anybody can review that at any time. Anybody can challenge it at any time. And there's like no, like in a way, like buyer's remorse. Like if you're buying carbon credits and like three months later, you're like, well, I didn't know that like something, you know, I didn't know about that data or I didn't know the relationship between the parties. It's all open on the blockchain. And right now, like, I mean, that's definitely a shortcoming. It's like you have to know a little bit of code to like go explore some of that data. But there's these new, like the new interfaces are coming, like what we'd be accustomed to like you know logging on to like a website and reviewing data like that stuff is coming like the WYSIWYG like you know type um what you see what you get kind of like more consumer facing interfaces coming but the but the idea is that it takes the the centralized actors out of the place out of, out of or out of uh you having to rely on them and anybody like open forest protocol basically anybody with a smartphone can start their own carbon project basically they can start uploading their data, taking pictures, reporting. What, their what field would the findings. data, what form would the ta data take? Like, give me an example, a real world example. Uh, so there's like, like they use a methodology. So even like a carbon methodology. So even like, um, like open forest protocol or region network, they, they have a, a methodology that's like a peer reviewed, like scientific methodology about like how you determine how much carbon is in the forest, how much carbon is in the soil. You know, there's, some of us are talking about animal carbon. Um, you know, we're working on like how much biodiversity is in the forest, like what the baseline level is of like a measurement, like the, like there's this, there's this term MRV, which is uh, measurement or some people call it monitoring, uh, reporting and verification. So those three things are key that like, if, if you go out and buy like an NFT that removes carbon and an NFT is a non-fungible token, like if you don't, if there's no MRV behind that, like you don't know if there's any impact, right? You don't like if this NFT is saving animals in the Amazon or protecting land in the Amazon. Like, how do you know that? Because you know some nonprofit or some website tells you the idea of the blockchain. Blockchains are immutable. They're a permanent record. They're <coughs> distributed, decentralized records where that that's like the central source of truth is what we're after, uh, rather than a centralized provider of that truth. Okay. I, I think I understand. So let me just ask one more follow up to make sure I understand. So, for example, if I if I was going to um, if I was going to have a hundred acres of of property somewhere that was going to be put aside for no development, and I'm just using that number, a thousand acres, whatever, and um, and so now I have to measure the value of that piece of property as a um, natural asset, right? So that might be like how many trees are on the property, what, what species of trees, um, you know, total biomass, I don't know, whatever those things are. Those are the metrics that then go into the, the blockchain to provide a, a verification that, yeah, this thousand acres actually is providing some net value. Yeah. So the, like carbon is the buzzword, right? But it's, sure. it really comes down to, to greenhouse gases or GHGs in like methane or nitrous oxide. Um, where they are converting that into a, a, what's called a CO2e or, or, or carbon dioxide equivalent in a ton, like metric ton. Yeah. And then that is priced by the market, whether it's the California compliance markets or the EU compliance markets, where these are mandatory carbon removal markets, or what, what the big emerging thing is the voluntary markets where these big, these net zero corporations are making these voluntary commitments to go net zero. They need to offset their what are called scope one, scope two, scope three emissions. And they need to have what are called verified reductions. 
So that goes, it, it all comes back to a CO2E, like ton of carbon. Like if you emit a thousand tons of carbon, you need to offset a thousand tons of carbon. And how many like tons of carbon, you know, does that, um, does that emit or, you know, or does that, does that land like your thousand acres, Mikey, like it depends on where you are, right? If you're up sure. in the Pacific Northwest or if you're in the Amazon versus Colorado, sure. You know, on, you know, on the low end, and, you know, I'm not a scientist, but like some land can only uh, sequester like three, four tons of carbon an acre where I have, you know, I have people talking about 125 tons an acre, wow. two, 200 tons an acre. So it really depends on like what's there. And that that's just like forest carbon. And then you, if you come into with like soil carbon, and then there's all these different new technologies related to like mineralization, biochar, where they're actually using different means to actually sequester more carbon on the same amount of land. So like by, by like sprinkling basalt rock and creating a reaction with water, it starts to permanently sequester carbon. So if you're a project developer, you can actually get more out of your project by doing these, by it's just land management, right? Of like how you manage it. Um, but the next, you know, the further down the line is like biodiversity, ecosystem services, clean water, clean air, that that land also uh, generates. And, th and that's a big discussion that's happening in the agricultural industry right now is like the farmers get paid for their yield of crops, but why shouldn't they get paid for their soil sequestration, their carbon sequestration? Why shouldn't they get paid if they do agroforestry where they're actually planting some trees, creating am animal habitat buffer? Uh, you know, why shouldn't they get paid for regenerative practices like non no till or organic um, or erosion control? pesticide control because those are other there's other downstream like as you know right there's other downstream impacts with with health and well-being and uh animals and whatnot so the idea is, is that yeah. there's like this stack of of capital that these properties that you know what are called externalities of so things that aren't valued properly in in our current economic system that now can start to be priced into the market and people should be you know like there's no in my mind there's no such thing as an externality because it's internal to someone like someone's going to pay that cost, right? Just because you're a big yeah. net zero corporation or corporation, you are saying that's not our responsibility and you off on someone else. Like someone, right, is going to have to bear that cost. Who who does bear that cost? You know, you gave an example of the farmer and if he, you know, plants wildlife habitat or or whatever, how does how does he get compensated for for doing that? So the I mean, I, I kind of hear two questions. Like one that, you know, like cost of like externalities like that, like that to me, that's like philanthropy and government, right? End up paying the cost of like externalities that aren't priced in your product. Uh, but but then on the other one of like, how do, the, how do those farmers get paid? That That's like the evolving market right now. Like there are ecosystem credit markets. There are uh, land bank, uh, wetlands mitigation credit markets right now. They're, in California, there's like species credits. You know, like I, the story I like to tell is like, you know, a guy called me up one day in my, you know, my former you know, real estate investment life in California. And he's like, I, I have a $6 million 1031 exchange. And I'm like, okay, great. He's like, I want to buy a drugstore. And so I said, okay, like I start looking for drugstores and I start talking to him and I'm like, well, what'd you sell? He's like, well, you never believe it, but these guys from Silicon Valley came in and they, they needed some salamander habitat. And so basically he sold an easement for salamander, I think it's called a tiger salamander in California. He he was in Fresno, so like inland, and so, you know sold land. Didn't even sell the land. He sold the rights, the the, the habitat rights or the biodiversity rights for that developer in Silicon Valley to offset their destruction of salamander habitat. Same thing. It's like the same thing with wetlands, but like that's the six million dollar salamander. So that that leads me to a question. Then Timo is like, so um, in that case, in that more traditional case you know, somehow someone's got to verify that those credits are worth something because the guy could sell that easement for the salamanders and then bulldoze that, put a road through there, do whatever. How does, how does the blockchain or how does the protocol verify that, that a project, you know, take my hypothetical thousand acres and let's say it's not even an act of uh, willful um, you know, destruction of, of the value of that property. What if a forest fire swept through there and burned all the trees? Like how do, how do, how does the, the, uh, the algorithm or the protocol ensure that the value continues to be realized from these projects? Yeah. I, yeah. I just to piggyback on that. I had a 
question about the verifier, like what, you know, who are these verifiers and what motivates them to spend their time verifying? Like, how do they get compensated for verifying a project? You know what I mean? Are they just cruising around the blockchain trying to verify these things? And <laughs> you know what I mean? So I, I kind of wanted to just piggyback on that, Mike. Yeah. No, and that's like, uh, John, that's exactly the, like the black box analogy of like, in, in like, Historically, carbon projects have been expensive to do, and they take a decent amount of time, effort, and specialized expertise. Like, if you want to get a carbon project up and running, in my, you know, from the conversations I'm having, it's like one to three years using the normal uh, historical verif verification methodologies. And that your project cost ends up, you have to hire a verification over time to do that. Um, whereas the blockchain, if you start to get into what, what are called tokenomics, where like open forest protocol is going to have a OFP, I think it's an OFP token, and regen network has the regen token. And those start to compensate on the ground people for whoever they are. Like they, they actually in on regen, for example, they're doing two things. Like they're they're running what are called validator nodes, like they're running computers to actually that help verify and secure the network. And they're getting paid to do that in regen token. Uh, and then there's people on the ground doing MRV, measurement, reporting, and verification, and they get paid in tokens. So that's like, it's creating a whole nother like sub economy because of the tokenomics. And that, that it, mm -hmm. like, yeah, you know, and that probably leads to the next question of like, what can you do with like a regen token or an OFP token, right? And like, yeah. So like, it comes back to liquidity. And that's a, a you know, something the crypto markets are working to solve. And it's, you know, it, these new exchanges are popping up where you, you can go exchange regen token. You can't go directly to dollars, but you can go to like Atom token. And then mm -hmm. from there, you can go to Coinbase. And then, so the, the tokenomics and the incentives of like, and, and it's like a reputation based system where the, the MRV professionals or the people on the ground verifying the projects, like if they want to earn more tokens, like their reputation is on the line as a verifier of the data. If their data starts to get challenged because it's on the blockchain, because it's open and transparent, their new livelihood in theory, it's very similar to like like Bitcoin mining, of like why people are incentivized to set up machines to mine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Listen, and there's a token. Oh, um, to uh, sorry, Mike. You go ahead. No, you go. Oh, does the token value the value of the token fluctuate? Um, I mean, is it like is does it fluctuate over a course of time? Yeah, I, it's so that's like another thing, like people are trying to address right now because like this is, I view this as very early days of like what's going to happen with tokens and ecosystems and in currencies. But like, yeah, if you get paid in a, a, a project token, right. I mean, if it's go, if it's highly volatile and you're like li livelihood and you know, you're in Colombia or Zambia or, you know, or even in the U S and your livelihood is dependent on this payment and you go convert it to a fiat to, to do your daily business. That volatility is very harmful, right? Could be very harmful, but it also could go in your favor. So it really depends on yeah. kind of what side of the coin you're on. So there are people talking about like stable coin type offerings or payments or where, or it goes back to liquidity. Like if you get paid in that token, you can then convert it to another crypto that's stable, right? Like a DAI or a UST um, or a USDC uh, that are pegged to the US dollar. So there's ways to like get rid of that volatility. Uh, but that, that's a huge, huge problem is like the, the volatility of it. Mm -hmm. Welcome to my uh, crypto portfolio. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, what, what, Johnny, what's what's the, the term you used? I'm going to log out of my Coinbase account and not check it for three years. Something, something like that. <laughs> yeah, I'd yeah. like to do that. Right, right. When you figure out you can't make that tuition payment on on, on getting the net, the, yeah. <laughs> all that hair you've been talking about is now just turning gray. Yeah, yeah. What happened to Johnny's <laughs> hair? <laughs> so, so Timo, one thing I noticed listening to the the podcast that you sent me to listen to, and then also reading your white paper, I was like, I'm really excited. I was like, Oh my god, this is the future. Like, I don't really get it, but I can. I, this has got a heavy whiff of like you know, something that really, one, has extremely high-minded goals and ideals, and, mm -hmm. and, then, and two, that, that is exciting because it feels independent of some of these um, 
uh, some of these uh, frameworks that have so consistently failed us for a long time now, you know, but then I also like all of us, the three of us have all owned businesses, own businesses currently have, you know, done things, entrepreneurial things. And, and we understand that, um, that there, there is a, a, a certain amount of human um, uh, base, human characteristics that comes into any dealings that, that, very often complicates or, or ruins efforts. And so my question is like, what, how, you know, so if you own a business and you're the only owner, good, bad, or otherwise you can make a decision and, and you got to live with it and other people got to live with it if they want to work with you. In a DAO, how, I don't totally understand how decisions are made. And then, it, and then what, what happens um, if a decision is made that is, was the wrong decision, you know, for, for lack of a fancier way to put it. Yeah. I mean, that, that's, uh, you know, I, I keep using the word, the word like experimental or, you know, the phrase early days, like there's, I mean, there's literally thinkers, like people working on this, like, like Dow thinkers. And, and we're just for reference, like we're Dow is, uh, stands for decentralized autonomous organization. And there's, there's people like working on this, like how should DAOs run? How should they operate? How should they be governed? Like, is it is it all for the collective or should individuals be protected in the collective? Like, how you know, how do people get their voice heard? How do you make sure that whales, right? Crypto whales don't come in and you know, back to John's point about price volatility. Like, how do you make sure they don't come in, buy a bunch of tokens, pump the price, and then dump the price and everyone else is left like hanging? Because it, it at the end of the day, these tokens are equated to value, right? Real world value and dollar. Right. Exactly. Um, so like, like, you know, if we back up a second on DAOs, what, right? Like, like DAOs are just like, if you're, if you're like a crypto bro, like into cryptography, you're going to be totally into like the decentralized part in the autonomous part of like, there's no centralized authority. Autonomous means auto, like automatic, like code executes and something happens. Um, and, and they're, they're very like, and they're into what are called, what's called fair launch, where it's like, everyone's equal, no matter how much work you do, you come, you buy a token, you like have an equal vote, right. And you can buy more tokens to get more vote, but then that's like a, that's a hierarchy because you had to come in with capital somewhere. And so basically it's like, you're buying more tokens. So like a fair launch can also include airdrop where you just are airdropping tokens out to other people to spread the, the wealth or the, the, you know, the network value. Uh, but but what I like to do is is like break that down like the the D the A the O like to me de it's like decentralized but it's also like democratized like 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 a lot of people in crypto like we think we're like reinventing like you know it's new it's like you know it's like cutting edge but it's like these human systems have been in place for hundreds if not thousands of years and there's many systems that were in place like 150 years ago with like co-ops for example like that actually capitalism just like pushed them out. Or like the Hawaiian like watershed management of like how land was divided and split among people and governed uh, among the families and the the or you know or tribal or in indigenous rights like these systems have existed so it's DAO is just to me that goes back to the O of like the organization it's like it's just a different way of organizing right and it's like like a lot of a lot of thinkers in the space are comparing DAOs to basically it's just a new form of a co-op. But instead of a one to one value or a one to one vote, regardless of who you are, how much effort you put in, there's what's emerging is, is called limited co-op associations. And Colorado, for example, has some of the leading uh, legal framework on, on what are called LCAs, limited cooperative associations, because there can be different shares or different classes of like stock or ownership of like, are you a worker? Do you, you know, do you like do the work? Do you manage it? Are you just an investor or are you just like a, a customer? So. Like that's one way to look at it. Um, I mean, it can be just a normal LLC, right? Where there's 10, it could be 10 members, 10 votes equal, or it could be a, um, a two member LLC. You know, or, you know it, there's, it can be a general partnership where someone comes in as running the show and there's other people with, with voters. Um, the, the idea though is like, is democratize, autonomous. And, and what, I, what I go with the O is like, I, I liken it to like an organism or like, biomimicry of like the idea being that like you know to your point or like the old ideals the old frameworks that got us into this mess aren't going to get us out of the mess so like we need faster ways to do things better 
And the, the, the word that comes up with DAOs a lot is hive mind. So basically you have a bunch of people who are focused on like a central goal, whether it be a white paper or a thesis or like we're going to buy the constitution, like constitution DAO or whatever. And they're working hard to, 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 to accomplish that goal. And they're able to achieve consensus faster. And the, because it's not hierarchical and you don't have to wait for the board to convene quarterly and then vote. And then you table like, you know, in a nonprofit, for example, or if a H an HOA or like a corporate board, like you don't like deliberate short term and then table long term and then wait till next quarter. The idea with DAOs is you basically you meet as often as you want to meet whoever's, you know, the phrases, whoever's paying attention is who's running the show. I mean, if you're not voting, you can delegate your votes with tokens. Like there's, there's what's called delegation. And, uh, you know, you can actually have someone else who you trust vote for you. But the idea is, is that it doesn't take a majority and it doesn't necessarily take a quorum. Like it can, right? Like a DAO can be set up that way. But the idea is like, we need to make a decision by the end of this week, you know, how much input, who has the knowledge, who has the resources, who has the expertise, to make that decision. And then you make the decision and you move on. And the okay. idea being is that, you, you get rid of bad actors by like, if they want to do more down the line, whether if you're dispersing funds or dispersing opportunity or deal flow or whatever, like right, they have to perform to come back into the system, to get more of whatever the resources they want. Hmm. <clears throat> we'll see, we'll see. Kimo, you were talking to, oh, go ahead, Mike. Well, I just like one follow up there. So you said something that I hadn't even really thought of, but it now, now I'm concerned about it. It's like, um, it, you know, so your success will be measured or the, the, the success of Basin would be measured by, you know, the net positive impact that the projects that you could come up with will have down the road. And then that's that net benefit is tied to uh, economic value that that benefit can 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 uh, garner on the on the market. And then then that value is realized through these tokens growing in value. Correct. This is a basic yeah. framework. Yeah, ba ba basic framework. Yes. Yep. Okay. Yeah, cre yeah cre creating long-term positive impacts at scale increases the value of the you know the, un the underlying assets and in, in the token. Yeah. So let's assume that the most of the people involved right now are like you and 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 have just nothing but the best intentions and and that see this as a vehicle to achieve positive change and and that there's in it it's tied to a market too and but what if so some let's say there's people. I'm sure this is already happening. There's people whose whole job it is is to run around in crypto and figure out what's hot and how to game it and how to do this arbitrage where they can, you know, make money today on something that's, you know, hot for whatever dumb reason. And then, you know, they don't they don't care at all what's behind it. So how do you guys, how will you guys safeguard against becoming a victim of, you know, your own success, basically, where People start somebody out there who's who's doing this strictly for the financial gain, see, you know, is paying enough attention to all these little corners of Web three that they're like, whoa, this Basin coin now this is hot, you know, and they don't care what it's tied to, and they they find some way to get in there and game it, and and strictly to realize that value in a short is term possible. Like how how, how are there safeguards that prevent that? So I think like to, to me, Mike, you, you run more of a risk of that, of like with a public token sale of like, you don't know who you're selling tokens to. And like, you know, like this, you know, I'll put a disclaimer in this podcast, right? About like securities laws and like, this isn't a security and that's what we're working with. There's, there's a test we have to pass called the Howey test to like make sure it's not a security, right? And so we're, and, I mean, that's another road we could go down is to actually issue a formal security under US security laws. and and do all that, but but we're working under like a trust structure, like a long-term perpetual evergreen trust structure is what we're looking at. And so the, the idea is that the value flows back to the, the main asset entity, the trust. It's like created in perpetuity and the, the value of the go governing that ecosystem, right, grows. And so, so yes, it's, it becomes ripe for like speculators, right? But like initially, is what's called progressive decentralization. So like the core team, like at the end of the day, like, right, who shows up does the work, like a you know, same thing, school board, HOA, like is, is the, you know, the 80, 20 rule, you know, the nine, you know, 90, 10 rule or whatever, you know, it's like usually only 10 to 20% of the people are actually paying attention and doing stuff. So like 
what we're looking at, you know, our following is a is a progressive decentralization model where we'll know all the actors in the basin ecosystem for some time. Basically, like you're not getting in the basin ecosystem just blindly or just like anonymously. Like you're like the, that's how the ecosystem is going to grow. But then you do run that risk of once you do a greater token sale, and the, you know the progressive decentralization is eventually the the core team gets edged out. Like the community itself owns more than fifty one percent of of the the project. So like the community it could be speculators. They could vote out the core team. They could. But the the thing is like for the for the operation to keep running, like you need those people who have been in it running and also have stakes in it. So the core sure. team, the investors. The advisors, like they all have stakes and they all are incentivized to keep it going as well. But there's a couple of different mechanisms like uh, lockups, right? If like if you get tokens, you can't sell for a year or, you know, they're basically vesting period. Like startups do that all the time. So that that's one way. Another way we're looking at, which is not is not fully mature, like uh, it's called quadratic voting, which actually starts to limit how much say one shareholder comes in and has. Like if, if a whale comes in and buys. 30% of the tokens or something, you know, somehow like quadratic voting is a way, the way, at least the way I understand it. And, and I haven't seen any like successful implementation. And I'm, I'm sure people listening will probably like, you know, start sending me stuff, but like quadratic voting, just like quadratic funding is a way to create bigger impact, dispersing multiple people's like voices, like making sure m multiple voices are heard rather than multiple dollars are heard. Like, you know, the voices of the 500 people in the Gitcoin grant who donated to Basin they had a bigger say of how much money came into basin instead of like the you know the the big whale donor who donated to him is not big but in relative like of people making ten dollar donations and one donor made a ten thousand dollar donation the quadratic funding was based off of the 500 people like it like that that outsized donor doesn't have an outsized say in mm -hmm. the way way the way gitcoin funded the project so like quadratic funding was derived from quadratic voting. And so we're looking at ways to like put that in our governance structure. And that's, so the governance structure all happens on chain as well. So it's like your token, your basically your tokens are your vote and you cast your vote. And then the protocol or the, the different programming language can then govern you know, or basically execute that code of how, you know, how those proposals are approved. Wow. Hey, Timo, you were talking about um, goals. Well, just, First, like Mike was talking about listening to that podcast and how it, it, it he's getting a whiff of something exciting here and and it just feels very positive with good intentions. I, I got the same same vibe from that. But um, in terms of Basin Dow, um, what are like what are some of your goals in terms of like you know short term goals that you feel are achievable and I don't know in the next six months you have specific kind of projects that you're hoping to achieve? Yeah, it's, I mean, so like. To, to me, I, I I do both, right? Like I go to the big vision of like what you guys were excited and sensing about the the Dave Forson podcast was like the the regenerative finance movement or the refi movement, which we haven't touched on yet, is like creating a money system that's backed by positive outcomes or ecological health or or human and, and health well being. And and instead of like the money system being backed by oil or gold or you know like slavery or tulips or Coal, like all the things money has been backed by in the past, like why shouldn't money be backed by clean air, clean water, healthy people, happy people, prosperity, abundance? And so the, the idea is with Basin Token in the Basin Project is to just be a part of, of what what we're calling, you know, people in the refi space are calling it money Legos. Is we're just we just want to be a part of the money Lego system that's providing helping provide on the ground real assets in in real outcomes that can go into this money that's backed by positive outcomes so there's going to be in my opinion there's going to be thousands of tokens that are like this whether they be backed by carbon you know like you know there's several like klima eden dow those are backed by carbon like diatime dow is backed by plastic cleanup using a methodology like we talked about earlier of like how many tons of plastic can you remove for the from the ocean who will pay you to do that basically they're their DAO and their currency is backed by that. Um, there's a biodiversity DAO and a natural capital DAO. And like, there's going to be, I think, like what are called social token DAOs. Like basically, like if you want to, you know, increase water health or you know make make ecosystems more healthy in an in an ecosystem, like why would someone pay you to do that? Um, 
So like Basin Token is going to, I feel like going to be a part of like thousands of currencies that are, that are doing this. And so, so that leads to the short-term goals of like, how do you derive those benefits that I'm talking about, right? Like how do you sequester carbon? How do you restore biodiversity? How do you conserve pristine habitat? How do you like, like even part of the Basin thesis is how do you uh, take abandoned properties and turn them into something? Or how do you like, how do you work with brownfields and Superfund sites that like these untouchable properties that people don't want to deal with because they're an externality and whoever polluted them has been gone for 50 years and the community is just sitting there. So Basin Dow, John, is looking at like legal structures, both for-profit and non-profit, how we protect liability to do those projects. The brain trust or I've mind, you know, we have 450 people in the discord and we had to shut it off because like there's too many people coming in each day. And we have 58 people that are like on the core, like founding team. And, and I, you know, we have a new waiting list for what, what's called season two, like quarter one is season one, Q2 will be season two. Like we already have a waiting list in three days of like 25 people. So like we're getting like this, this hive mind, this brain trust is growing. And the idea is, is that we bring properties in, property rights in as fast as possible or as cheap as possible. And then the brain trust goes to work, the hive mind goes to work. And, and our hive mind isn't anonymous crypto bros who like are like gonna pump the price of basin. Like, they're ecologists, they're climate scientists, they're biologists, they're philanthropists, they're uh, business people, advisors, startup people. Uh, and we have a few PhDs. I mean, we have many master's degrees in, in the core team. It goes back to that conversation of like in real life, like real people, not anonymous people doing real stuff on the ground for real climate action. And, and we're, you know, want to use the, the bigger metaverse tools to do that. But so like, but short term, we're we're starting a a five hundred one c three to accept real property donations to do to accomplish our mission, basically to, to onboard carbon removal, natural capital, uh, biodiversity restoration faster. Because there's all these properties around the country that people don't believe it, but like high net worth individuals, corporations, like there's abandoned properties. Even in a good economy, there's seven billion dollars of of transactions a year just in the real estate donation market. And most charities aren't in a position to accept those donations. So hmm. the, ba the Basin Foundation is going to be onboarding that stuff and then work with Basin Global, our for-profit entity, to basically those rights that are derived from those properties will be part of the underlying value of the Basin token. So Basin Foundation hmm. will be managed separately, but it is it, it does work in conjunction and it can work with other protocols. We can like we could accept real estate donations for Eden Dow or or. Arc River Trust or any any you know any real world organization, we can accept real property donations and then have the resources, the skills, the knowledge, the you know all this work we're doing on the back end about how do we monetize and increase the value, increase the the well being of these properties. That that's what goes. That's what's underlying the token. So so that's that's like a short term goal is like getting the the foundation set up and the other like some of the other workflows revolve around like these more technical de details of like. Are we a what's called an unincorporated nonprofit association, which is like crazy to me, but that's like what A16Z, like Andreessen Horowitz, is like recommending that DAOs form under. But like from a real estate ownership perspective, that's like scary as all get up because like there's, there's no limited, in theory, there's no limited liability protection of like when you're dealing with like contamination or real property. Um, you know, do we? And we can't incorporate the the main entity as a for profit because, or excuse me, as a not for profit because there eventually is going to be profit, right? There's going to be value increase. So we're you know, looking at trust structure. So that that's like a short term goal. Basically, you know, we're here January twentieth. Like I hope by the middle of February we'll have the entity worked out, and then we have a team working on like what we call the property rights or property layer or property like um, like the capital stack, like in finance, like. Capital stack is known just as like financial capital, like debt, equity, mezzanine. But like we're working on like what's the biodiversity, what what's the what's what ecosystem services are on the property, what animals are on the property, what trees are on the property, what's the habitat, what's the, the you know the flora, the fauna, what are the oil rights, what are the water rights, what are the mineral rights, and looking at all those things because because we see a future evolving guys of like money Legos where this stuff is like plug and play, where basically someone might want just biodiversity rights from one of our properties. Someone might just want mm -hmm. carbon rights from one of our properties. 
someone might just want social impact rights. They want like the PR that came with the clean water that was generated from this project up upstream. So like, like and short term goals. Sell off, do you sell off those rights? So like, I mean, great, great question. Like, like if you sell like an offset, right? Or a credit, a credit, you're selling it. Like you, mm -hmm. you, you, you've derived it. We sold it. it. Yeah. You, it, what we're looking at is more of like a lease model, which in crypto, and that's what, why yeah. going back to some of the initial questions about like web three, like staking it, or liquidity mining or liquidity pooling is a big thing of like, so we see a world in like where there's what are called DEXs or decentralized exchanges, AMMs, which are automated market makers. We see a world in which other protocols, whether that be Eden DAO, Chi DAO, Maker DAO, Cello, who's creating a new new money system, if they want this stuff on their balance sheet, then we basically can stake it with them, and they pay us yield basically for the derivative of what we're creating. And in an, you know, another conversation is like outcome versus like practice based of like outcome is like, right, you try and like generate as much carbon as possible, as fast as possible, and you sell it off. Whereas practice based, right, is more a more long term view of like, why should someone steward the land better in a more like ecologically sound way? And so, our, so like the staking model to me works really well in like a practice based model because it's like an ongoing, like, like one of our goals, guys, is like, is evergreen perpetual funding like legacy type projects that are going to outlive us and that, that's like why the blockchain is so appealing of like you put it on the blockchain and we don't have to be here anymore right like it can the governance is set up under the token mechanism token structure under the the protocol and the governance of these properties the operation of these properties are are funded basically using different you know what are called DeFi, um, you know are now going to be called refi mechanisms to do that Timo, with refi, cool. yeah, it is cool. Um, with refi, um, the concept is 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 very is very cool, and um, and I think in the wrong hands could go, you know, could get real close to the rust on the on the rust meter, <laughs> you know, yep. because and here's let me ask it this way, like um, because right now, as I understand it, the, the way the market works is mm. you're offsetting. It's like you know. I'm thinking of like 15 years ago, right? When you could, you could, if you wanted to have a bumper sticker on your car that showed that you offset the emissions from your vehicle, you'd go on to one of those websites and pay. I remember a guy who had that. Which you know, this guy was a tool. <laughs> 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 yeah. So, you know, right. Or you could, you could offset your, you know, your, your flight to vacation with your family. Mikey, you were, you were ahead of the game on that one though. No, was, I, man, I you, caught, were, you were 20 years before your time, dude. I caught a lot of grief on that, man. <laughs> Driving to go kayaking and stuff, but you know, you could offset, you could offset a flight or whatever. And so with refi, my question is like, can, can the refi economy exist independent of the extractive economy? Like long-term, maybe this is a, Maybe this is a higher level question than we need to be asking right now, but you know, because we're not anywhere close to that point in in the world. But I mean, the goal the goal obviously is to get to net zero, right? And so, can can, can the refi economy function long term outside of the extractive economy? So, so two. I mean, great great question. I think we should address it because it's it's all baked into like the thesis of like why this stuff is is valuable, right? In an extractive economy clean water, clean air, healthy habitats, like, you know, what's more valuable is like a degraded wasteland that you like clear cut, right? Because that's the most economic value. Um, but in a regenerative economy, you have to manage like for the long term. And, there, and, there's, kind of, and there's, there's two things, like one of like the risk of like the same actors, like same centralized actors coming in under the same terms we're talking about today in buying up all these assets, controlling all these assets. And, it, and it's literally happening right now like in in like the new york stock exchange has launched what's called natural asset companies nacs which are basically just going to be hedge funds private equity groups high net worth individuals big corporations basically investing in these nacs and then they go and buy all the same stuff we're talking about so in a, in a way they're our competitors but they're also like our collaborators because we we view ourselves as like a supplier to their to their needs like to their wants so like you run the risk of like just the same old same old the top 11 percent of the world owning owning all assets 
So that's why we go back to like decentralization and crypto and basically a, a more bottom up method of achieving, you know, ownership of like, it's not the top 10% doesn't own all the world's assets. Um, so, so that, that was number one. And then number two, like it, it goes back to like, like re regeneration, like what, what are the incentives and what are the value exchanges and why this stuff matters. And there's certain like, I mean, the task force for nature disclosure, for example, or the task force for climate disclosure, which are our big government bodies that are making corporations have to disclose their climate risk, like their resilience risk, their climate disaster risk, uh, wildfire storm risk, or, or nature, they're going to have to disclose like what uh, their biodiversity risk is or what their supply chain risk is of if they are cutting down palm forests for palm oil, or if they're, you know, like trying to get water and they're depleting a water, an aquifer, and then shipping that water. But, you know, you've, you've dealt with that with, in, you know, Salida and in Buena Vista, like they're shipping that water outside of the aquifer. They're, like what's, you know, love it or hate it. Like there's going to be an offset economy because we can't like, in a perfect world, we wouldn't have to offset, right? We, we wouldn't like burn carbon, right? We wouldn't uh, pollute the air. But like, you know, like, you know, there's a guy who, d who does what's called digital wildcatter. And he, he follow, he's a big, big on like the oil and gas business. And he stated it very well. He's like, if, if we shut down all, you know, and he's biased, right? Because he's natural gas and oil. But like, if we shut down our fossil fuel economy, the food chain is going to collapse. The manufacturing chain is going to collapse. The economy is going to collapse. Like there's no way we can transition, right? And with, without having fossil fuels as a transition fuel. And in, in theory, like the, you know, the sun doesn't shine all the time. The wind doesn't blow all the time. You know, like nuclear, people are nervous about nuclear. Hydrogen has its risks. So like there's going to be a, a, like a role for, um, like fossil fuel. So that needs to be offset. Like those emissions need to be offset. So that's like a, a more balanced economy. And then same with like the, you know, the, they call it the three F's, the, the food, fiber, and forest is like, it'd be perfect. Like if we didn't like, like chop down trees, right. For, for, uh, for buildings and wood and everything, but like we have to, right. It'd be perfect if we didn't have to grow crops and then grow them again, uh, or, you know, to get our clothes from cotton or whatever. Um, so like, they're going to need offset. The theory or part of our thesis is like the offset economy is the only way to create balance. So like if you're in an extractive industry, right, like you have to like somehow offset that by doing something good. And then that creates the balance of like an ecosystem. Do you think there's enough or has anyone tried to figure out if there's enough assets, natural assets available to offset everything that needs to be offset? So in, in carbon terms, like there's a big debate about like, there's not like, you know, the, the car, carbon, like I'm a part of the air miners community and they're big on like technological carbon removal. And most of that science says that like nature-based solutions, natural co climate solutions aren't enough, can't sequester enough carbon, especially with the rate of like deforestation, development, extraction that's happening. So we need like technological solutions. So there's a whole slew of, of people working on that. But, but what I point to, Mike, is like, like Hank Paulson's report on investing for nature. Uh, he, you know, he founded, you know, former Treasury Secretary, founded what's called the Paulson Institute now. They have a huge biodiversity arm. Their, their estimate, Mike, to avoid like a mass species extinction is like a trillion dollars a year for the next nine years. That's just needed in like nature investment of like restoration, conservation. Like this isn't money necessarily coming into the space. That's just what's needed. Right. Either philanthropy, government to like, like, you know, you've heard the term Anthropocene, like we're basically extincting yeah. ourselves, like if we don't change our ways. So like we're trying to be part of that trillion dollar a year solution for the next nine years of redirecting resources, capital, energy into financing. What's called the financing for nature gap. Like how do you finance that trillion dollars a year? And then, hit, you know, their, their analysis goes out to 2050, like most analysis. And it's still like 700 billion a year after that. So it's, like, you know, 693 billion or something a year. You know, what's amazing, what's amazing about what you just said, like I'll just editorialize for one second is, you know, when you think of when, when, when COVID hit, right. And it was this crisis that, you know, and, and people had to stay home from work. And I mean, what was that first, um, uh, I mean, that first direct payment program, um, I can't even remember the name of it now, um, 
I mean, that was a trillion dollars, right? I mean, it was a, it was a trillion dollars that we mobilized in three months or something mm -hmm. into the economy to to help people stay home from work and recover from from that initial COVID wave. So what's what's remarkable is that we we could we could do it in America quite quite easily actually if we if we felt that same that same you know looming sense of urgency and disaster that that COVID provided in that one moment. Yeah, like like people don't like the term like. But it's like wartime effort. Like if you look back at history and like what the you know, the world powers mobilized for World War One or World War Two or the space race or the Cold War, like that's what people are saying is like we just need a wartime effort that's concentrated on like you know the, these efforts. But it's like an education gap of like why should people care? And, and unfortunately, the only reason people care, and that you know that's what one thing that motivated me to action is you know us being on pre-evac from our house twice, or like you know you you've had fires. John, you know, obviously in Boulder, you guys have had fires. Like you see, you, know, you see droughts, you see houses being burnt, you see, you know, you see flooding. Like if you're affected by this stuff, then all of a sudden you're like, oh, like I should do something, right? Or pay attention. So it's like this this whole education thing. Like pictures and words only do so much. It's more like people have, you know, like New York City started paying attention right after Sandy, right when when all that flooded. Like, oh, we need to do something about it, right? Johnny, you asleep there? No, I'm awake. <laughs> well, um, just looking at some of my notes here, Timo, um, you know, this, this might seem, seem trivial, but, but it's just being somebody that isn't, I wouldn't say I'm native to this stuff. And one of the first conversations you and I had around this was, you know, I'm, I'm on, I'm largely on Twitter to like get breaking news about the Denver Nuggets. And, uh, <laughs> you know, and, and is there like, a lot of breaking news for that? Well, you know, I mean, there can be Johnny, there really okay. can be, but, uh, you know, so I'm not, I, I don't really do a lot on Twitter. I don't have followers. I don't, and I don't, and I noticed, you know, when I started following your, your posts and, you know, and you're my brother and I love you. So I start liking things that I really don't have the first clue what any of it means. <laughs> You know, I'm like, I'm, I'm reading it and I'm like, well, I, I speak English. So I, there's our English words in this tweet, but there's a bunch of vocabulary here that clearly has meaning to someone that doesn't have meaning to me. And so I'm just curious because the, the guy in the, um, what was the guy's name in the podcast, Dave? Yeah. Yeah. So Dave talked about Twitter as well. So what role is Twitter playing in this movement? I mean, what, it, it seems pretty central. So, I mean, this stuff, which, which, you know, to get a little esoteric, right? Like it's in the consciousness, like people are working on this like everywhere and like regardless of Twitter, but like Twitter is like, it's a, it's so fast moving. It, I mean, it, it, I mean, it almost moves, you know, not at the speed of thought, but like you can go tag anybody. You can listen in conversations. Like you can do a search for conservation or natural capital or, or uh, carbon or in like all of a sudden you have like some of the world's best minds or, you know, you're like privy to a conversation or, or Twitter spaces, for example, like you can just hop on there and see a Twitter space and join a conversation and actually be able to talk to people working on this stuff. So like Twitter as a tool, it's like moves so fast. You don't have to do like a LinkedIn request. You don't have to be on Facebook. You don't have to like scroll through an Instagram feed. It's just, it's moving so fast and there's so many different connections. And the, you know, I'll, I'll give kudos to the Twitter algorithm. Like they're starting to serve stuff that like, I'm like, shit, that's like super interesting. Like that's like, that's a conversation like, I follow those people, they're following someone else. It's a conversation that like I want to be in on without me even searching. So like it's 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 like an entry drug, right? Or like an entry point for it. And it's and it's helping evolve the space because you can like test an idea and get questions answered. You can have a dialogue. But to your point about like jargon in in slang, but I mean that's what we're using on Twitter because that's what you attract like like people with, right? If you're talking about web three or if you're if you're using hashtag what wag me or however you want to say it, we, you know, we, we all going to make it is the, the acronym or, or why regret, why regret or why, why regret is we all going to regenerate earth together. Like all these different like hashtags, like, um, like that's how you attract the other people who are talking about that stuff basically. But like the refi space in general, we're having a lot of conversations about how do you message this stuff for non-crypto, non-blockchain. And, and like, that's a, a role I'm playing. Like, bridging the gap of like scientists and like biologists and bringing them into web three because when you you know like you start to talk about that stuff with like just traditional academics or people doing real on the ground work you mentioned crypto or blockchain they like freak out they're like 
They're like, you know, it's too much energy usage. Right. It's right. polluting the planet. It's part of the problem. But it's like, no, there's like, I mean, we have answers for all that stuff. So it's like, a, it's like an education. I mean, it's just a media and marketing problem. Yeah. But, you know. Yeah, so, it makes sense. <clears throat> Isn't that mostly attributed to um, Bitcoin versus the other uh, cryptocurrencies? Is it does bit, is it just Bitcoin that gets a bad rap for energy usage, or is it other coins and tokens too? Yeah, I mean, all of them are generally lumped in because of the Bitcoin narrative, and, and Ethereum is mm -hmm. part of it also right now. Yeah, you know, that it's it's a proof of work, which the work is the computers doing the work sucking the energy mm -hmm. burning you know burning the energy um so that's the main energy usage is the bitcoin and ethereum network but ethereum is moving to ethereum 2.0 which will be what's called proof of stake and stake mm -hmm. is based on a trust system a, a token system where you're staking your tokens and that's you know we're talking about that with basin tokens or natural capital it, it's a built-in mechanism like you're putting something of value at risk to secure the network and it uses like a fraction of the energy and then there's yeah. several protocols out there, John, like that are, you know, like Tezos is, I think they're calling themselves like the net zero, you know, blockchain or like, like Ixo is a is part of the Cosmos ecosystem. And they're, they're working to be like net negative where they have it built in their blockchain or their algorithm where it's actually buying offsets for any, any energy that's being used in their computational power. It's basically creating a hmm. net negative effect. So like it, you know, if, my opinion is that as energy gets cheaper and more abundant, it's not going to be as, as of a big of a deal as it is now. And with these new technologies uh, based on people or proof of stake and validation services rather than computational power, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's being addressed. But, th but that's a really great, great point. Yeah, I think I heard a podcast from a guy named um, Nick Carter who was talking about, um, you know, that if you because it does seem like there's a certain segment of our society that's made a real quick judgment about crypto, um, you know, of all the worst aspects of like, you know, young hoodie wearing tech bro culture being just lumped in with with crypto. And I heard him make a point that, you know, if you if you if you've just decided and closed your mind to it, then you're immediately going to just focus on all these negative aspects that really are just early stage growth of the technology but if you if you believe that the the technology the platform has value then you'll see that over time and over the a period of time as this as this scales up that that those problems can be addressed and that that the underlying concept the underlying um, technology or whatever the right terminology is that that underlying core technology has real value it's worth trying to solve those problems yeah yeah totally. the, and the, like the, and the, yeah the blockchain yeah yeah, and, and that's we haven't mm -hmm. really touched on it much, but like this this whole you know the the Web three ethos is like it's the money Lego ethos. It's taking like decentralized finance, DeFi, moving it to ReFi, like regenerative finance and like more sustainable, inclusive, distributed finance. In in money Legos, like the idea is that it's it's moving around the incentives and the value exchanges that that get rid of those things. Like what's the energy problem, right? What's the biodiversity problem? What's the carbon problem and then using technology to make automated decisions like what's the inflation problem of, of a currency to like to actually correct those problems on the fly and that and that goes back to some of the original questions you guys had about like DAOs. it's like a faster way to organize and move you know move faster together better like it's like like you know that, that's the the scale and the speed we need is like is it's almost unprecedented and it's hard to Fathom. And, and that's another thing that like Basin has succeeded at is attracting people who are like scared about climate change. They have FUD, like fear, uncertainty, doubt. They're depressed about like COVID, depressed about, you know, climate change, forest fires, the news, and they need an outlet. And like I've had so many people DM me and they're like, dude, I feel like if I if now if I take ap action, like you're inspiring us to take action or you're giving us an outlet. So I go look for forests in our neighborhood or, you know, our, our area or like there's an abandoned building. There's, you know, our water. It's empowering. Like, yeah. So it's, it's like empowering. The, yeah. So Web3 is like giving the tools like there's all these cool projects I could plug, like like Acres DAOs. Like basically, Kianga is like creating the system to create regenerative local economies. And she's just giving them the infrastructure on Ethereum. Anybody can spin up an Acre DAO and start to enact change. In their community without having to know anything about like basically crypto or ethereum or it's just like the tools to vote govern fund 
you know, like like Aaron Wright, one of the leading attorneys on this stuff in for like DAOs, like like he the way he akins it DAOs to is like it's it's friends on the internet with a bank account like doing stuff they love. Like it's yeah. like yeah, so it's like it's just a new way of doing business and, and making impact. Well, it's, it's, yeah, it's exciting because, if you, you know, if you think of like the old model of doing positive things, right, it's, it's, a, it's an accessory to the economy or it's an accessory to our politics that you have a, like a, and this is not to criticize any traditional, uh, you know, uh, large scale, like nonprofit, like say the Sierra Club. I mean, they've, they've been tremendously successful in a lot of ways over a long period of time, but it's all based on cajoling politicians or business leaders to do the right thing because there's some marketing value to it. And, and I, and I understand that that's a piece of this as well, but, um, but the idea of this more broader based, more inclusive economy uh, that is accomplishing those same goals strikes me as a, a more, um, it just seems like a, a solution that could actually garner some results in the future. As we see that our politics and our, the traditional models of getting things done, they're kind of breaking down right now, you know, not to be depressing, but they're, they're failing us. You know, I mean, today was a good example where, you know, the Senate can't even agree on things like voting rights, you know? And so, I mean, we're we're being failed by these traditional systems. Yeah. I mean, I mean, like to that point, like my friend Elliot and, and Matt, they, they spun up what's called climate Dow and it's a web three, way of doing shareholder activism and basically they're they're gonna you know be like joining the ranks of engine number one of like buying stocks and voting using the hive mind you, doing the same thing that like the what's what was the game game stop you know like the yeah. whole reddit like yeah, yeah doing the very similar mm-hmm. things to that using the hive mind to like influence the public markets and they're using these technologies and these incentive mechanisms with real money to do real shit like to influence those systems, Mike, that like you're talking about of like, yeah. how do you like, like the politicians won't do anything until there's something's at risk for them. Right. Or like, yeah, same with the, the they're not even that at this point, they won't do anything at all. <laughs> <laughs> like, right. There's no, yeah. You just make up a story about how the sky isn't blue anymore, you know? And so, well, I, you know, we're coming up on time. Um, but you know, as we joked, Mike last week, like the, the, the risk, right. Is like, the, the status quo remains the same and the government, the power that be like enact legislation that tries to ban this stuff or they start cracking down on securities laws or re- the regenerative economy does fails to take shape because the extractive economy just has too much power, too much money. You know, the, you know, the, the, the old guard, right. Um, they're just going to, they're going to protect every, you know, their bags, right. As much as they can for as long as they can. And so that's, that's the risk is like, I mean, what did I joke with you? Risk, hundred percent risk is very possible, or hundred percent loss is very possible. <laughs> yeah, but you know, some some gambles are worth taking, right? Well, well, that that's the theory, right? Is like is like we need to figure out how to move from three year, five year, seven year outcomes to like forty year, hundred year, yeah, you know, thousand year outcomes. Like that, we're not going to be see be here to uh, experience, but our you know, we all have kids, right? And like their kids and it sounds cliche, but you know, like seventh generation, or I mean the Iroquois Indians, right? They they saw all this. I mean, they they that was part of their philosophy of like, we're gonna make decisions for the seventh generation, like how we steward. Yeah, you know, we're you know, like like we go back to this slogan of like we are all owners. So creating an ownership economy where basically you can own like your, you know, like your sports team, right? You can own your collectibles, you can own your art with groups of people, like you don't have to. You know, you, you can be a part owner of whatever you want, whether it be a consumer brand, whether that be a video messaging service, whether that be a social network. Like that's that's the power of Web3 is like we are all owners, not you know, we're not just users. Right. We're not we're not being profited from or on with we're, we're actually part owner of the system. I'm proud of yeah, you. I love that. I'm proud of you. Yeah. Bro. I'm excited. <laughs> to be, job, w- I'm, I'm excited to be witness to the to the movement, you know, and and uh, m- maybe find a way to contribute. Yeah, me too. I understood about half of what you said today, but if I had to bet on a horse, it would be you, Timo. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> like, so I guess we didn't accomplish the the slow the jargon. Um, no, listen, we're we're getting there. No, there was like a lot of there. jargon being. Yeah, there was a lot of jargon being thrown around, but yeah, I, you yeah, explained yeah, yeah. a lot of it, Timo. That was good. 
Yeah, no, we're getting there. I think we're getting there. And like, I think, um, you know, um, you, what I've learned in the last week is about 300% more than I knew a week ago, you know, from sitting on the chairlift with you last Saturday to, you know, to reading and listening to stuff this week. So, uh, you know, I think that, um, if somebody with my, uh, meager, um, intellectual skills can, can bone up that quickly, I think it's possible for a broader audience to understand this concept. Yeah. I mean, I mean, what I go back to Mike is like, it's, it's like crazy, the amount of stuff, you know, to your, to your Twitter comment, like there's like every day, there's like five new DAOs. Like I can log on Twitter and it's like, oh, there's a new DAO for that. There's a new right. DAO for that. You know, oh, we're trying to buy that piece of land. We're trying to save that species. We're creating a regenerative land trust. Like we're creating a public, you know, public lands protocol. Like, I mean, there's like this new, you know, ocean DAO, like moon, moon jelly, like all, you know, all these different things. Like this, this, the, the pace of change is just like crazy. So like, like education is a key, key component of it. And awesome. Timo, is there a, is is there an upside financially for getting involved with these DAOs, or is it you know what I mean? Is there I mean, is it like an investment or a or a donation? Yeah, yeah, like so, I'll give you an example. Like like ENS name server, like Ethereum name server. Like I bought like a I bought Timo ETH right for my ETH. It points to my Ethereum address, and, and like mm-hmm. I've been getting airdrop tokens. I've been getting airdrop. Uh, NFTs, like my profile pick is from Climate DAO. Like they just sent it to my ETH address. But when I bought that, mm-hmm. I didn't, I didn't think anything of like the Ethereum name service. I was like, oh, it's a few hundred bucks or whatever to register the name. I can receive money there. And then like there's all this talk about like the ENS DAO or the Ethereum name server DAO. And like there's Mikey texting me, <laughs> three percent. Uh, sorry, I yeah, I have an energy problem here, which is that I don't have my power cord at my office. <laughs> yeah, but but Johnny, like the the Ethereum, the ENS DAO basically said if you bought a domain name, right, or if you participated in this network at any time over the last, they do what's called a snapshot. And if you were if your address was on the snapshot, we're going to airdrop you tokens. You, you have to go do a claim. And so I like went and claimed like my ENS. There's like 28 ENS. I was like, okay, 28. Like, I don't know what that is. And I went and looked. I'm like, dude, that's like 1,500 bucks that like I got for nice. for free. Like, you know, like like Acre DAOs airdrop me a thousand Acre tokens. Like, I don't think that's equated to money yet. But the idea is that like if if you guys participate in you know like basically buy into Basin right or buy into the the governance of what Basin is going to do, there's value like that's accruing to the governance token around that. And then we're, we are going to do airdrops. We're going to like spread this out to people, and that's. And, and do token swaps with other DAOs. Like that's going to be part of Basin's thesis is like, we'll give you Basin tokens. You'll give us so many, whatever DAO tokens those are. So this whole ecosystem is like, it's like a mycelium network. It's like the mushrooms in the forest all like are supporting each other in regenerating the soil so that they can all be stronger, healthier and reproduce. So. Right on. Cool. All righty. Well, thank you. Check- so, Appreciate. So, so, so here's the hard sell. You want my Venmo, PayPal or my, ETH address, or you want my PO box to send me a check? I was gonna, I was gonna send you a carrier pigeon with a <laughs> with a bag of gold. Yeah, I gotta dig up some of my gold um, out of my prepper area, and I'll shave off some <laughs> gold bullion, and then just convert that into basin, and we're good. Well, 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 sounds good. I I appreciate your support as always, Mikey, and I'll move your name, and you know, John, I'll move both your guys' names up. John John didn't complain about where his name was on the list, but on the you thank did, you Michael, list. So. No, I was just glad to be above fish. As long as I stay above fish, I'm good. <laughs> Keep me above the fish line. <laughs> Keep me below Jerry and above fish, and we're all good. <laughs> <laughs> right on, boys. It's good to talk. All to right, guys. Thanks for your time, yeah. guys. Yeah, appreciate your. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Take care. Okay. Later. Bye.